we've all run to things we know just ain't right when there's a better life when there's a better life than you got pain he's a pain taker if you feel lost he's a way maker if you need freedom or saving he's a prison shaking savior if you got chains he's a chain breaker if you believe it if you receive it Somebody testify If you believe it And you receive it If you can feel it Somebody testify, testify If you believe it you receive it If you can feel it Somebody testify say uh, welcome. I'm happy to uh, see you guys here. So many familiar faces. So many new faces. I love seeing that. I love seeing that. I'm happy particularly about today because we get to eat a lot. If you <laughs> I'm ready for that. Aren't you, Mary? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I'm ready to eat. Are you ready to do announcements? <laughs> I'm almost ready to do Good morning. I still I am you. so sorry. Thank you for covering for me. I totally just you know, I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to say. I'm glad you're here. And there are connect cards on clipboards near where you're sitting. There should be. If there are not, we do have some um, on the information table. We want to make sure that we can connect with you. There are pens on those tables. I feel like I'm out of breath. I'm running up here. Golly, apparently I'm out of shape, too. Maybe I shouldn't eat after church. <laughs> But I'm going to. Maybe we should take a nap. Yeah, I'm going to do that too. Um, so connect cards. Please put your information on there. We want to know how to reach you. We want to know um, what your needs are. So please fill one out and drop it in the joy box. And seems like there's one other thing that I am supposed to mention before I turn off the mic. But I... Well, that's, have you checked in on Facebook? He didn't give me that announcement this morning, but I actually did check in on Facebook this morning, so I encourage you to do that as well. And you know what, I'll think of it as soon as I turn off the mic and step down. Um, but I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. But I thought I wasn't doing that today. Anyway, I will, okay. So, um, if, if you need a Bible or a notebook or first time visitor on the tables, you can um, grab a Bible, you can grab a notebook, and then deeper study on Wednesdays, 5.30, there's usually food. Uh, last week, we had more people than we have ever had. It, it's growing, so join us, it is a lot of fun. We really are digging into the Word and the common table on Thursdays. So 4.30, uh, last week was a little crazy because we had dinner, then we broke down dinner, cleaned the building, set up the cots, and opened a cold night shelter. 
for Thursday and Friday night. So uh, that's partly why I'm still scatterbrained because I haven't recovered from it yet. But it is a wonderful thing to be a part of. Thursdays, 4.30, join us anytime. Just come and see what's going on. Dinner, um, showers, hygiene items, clothing, uh, next door. It, it really is a cool thing to be a part of. I encourage you to join us. And now I'm officially going to turn it back over to Eli because I have not remembered the other thing I was supposed to say, but I'm glad you're here. <laughs> yeah, it's been, as, as she said, it's just been a, a, a thrown together kind of um, deal. <laughs> But I absolutely love doing it. It's, um, I don't know, it's something about, something about helping people just makes me want to say it. Like there's a old church choir singing in my soul. <laughs> that was pretty clever, don't lie. <laughs> there's revival. sound like I've never heard before. Hallelujah. I'm so happy. I'm so happy to hear this praise coming at me from behind. I am so happy that everybody's here worshiping on a great day. I'm so happy that we get to eat afterwards. That almost drew more applause than the praise. 
Well, good morning. We got a few announcements. Bingo, Monday nights. Come on and join us. You know, that is how we help fundraise, keep the lights on, and have fellowship. So if you're just looking for something to do on Monday, there's no more Monday night football, so come on and join us for Bingo. It's almost the same. God's good. All the time. All the time. Okay. How are you? Wonderful. Our kids can be dismissed this time. For those who may not have gone back to the back, it is good to be here. My name is Scooter. I'm the lead pastor here. And I'm excited about today. You know why? Why? Green. No, because I get to worship the Lord and fellowship with my brothers and sisters. What do I look like? Somebody just likes to eat all the time? Yeah. Oh. Don't ask the question if you don't want to know the answer. So on the fifth Sunday of the year, every every month here, we we do potluck. Why? Because one of the main functions of the church is to get together and visit. It's not just to come sit in your pew and and talk to the person that sits in your pew by you. And come in and leave. We're supposed to fellowship with one another. We're supposed to visit with one another. We're supposed to uh, uh, celebrate and have joys with one another. You know, we're supposed to cry and, 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 and help one another in tough times together. We're supposed to do that. We're supposed to, God intended us to do life with him and with one another. So that's what Fifth Sunday is all about. Gives us just a little bit of a chance to do life together and I get to eat y'all's food. There it is. There it is. <clears throat> My allergies are still kicking in. I do got some water and a lemon drop. Let's try that today. I love Florida weather. I hate Florida plants. We have been preaching, and I concluded my series called Rooted, where we talked about plants, and we talked about planting, and we talked about growing, and we talked about pruning, and we talked about harvesting. And this week, Mary asked me, she says, what are you going to preach on next week? And I said, I don't know. I haven't made my mind up yet. She says, well, I just need to know if I need to move the tomatoes and stuff off the table because Mary has kind of taken over the Ministry of Interior Decoration around here. <laughs> and I said, you know what? For all that stuff to grow, it usually takes a grower. A grower, right? A grower. Well, there's a Kelton uh, scripture about the farmer. And I wanted to talk about that piece of it. So I was kind of done with the series about growing, but I'm expounding in that same vein around here. Because what we talked about was how to successfully grow and how to successfully prune and how to successfully do these things. But you know what? I also shared earlier that some people got it, some people ain't. I'm not a great green thumb person. My father could look at plants and they would bear fruit. My brother, you go to this house, there's plants everywhere. We bring our animals inside. You go to his house when it's cold weather, it looks like a jungle. He brings all his plants inside the house. Hmm. And as much as there are good farmers, there are foolish farmers. Do foolish things. And Jesus actually addressed that. But it ain't like you think. He didn't become a fool because he couldn't grow. It's actually quite the opposite. Today, the title of my message is The Foolish Farmer Forgot Some Stuff. So the foolish farmer forgot some stuff. We've all heard that parable in scriptures, but sometimes we forget the real meaning of the story. And just what did the foolish farmer do and just what did he forget so today that's going to be what we talk about before we do that we're going to go to the Lord in prayer this morning a lot of prayer needs in our midst I know several families who aren't feeling well their sickness or illness I know people who are traveling this week and I know this everybody needs prayer amen, amen. so can we just take just a moment before we preach and dig into God's word this morning do a couple things let's lift each other up in prayer that's important, right? Pray for me as I pray for you. And let's prepare our hearts to receive God's word. You know, that's just ink and paper right there. It's, oh, it's the Holy Bible. It is, but it's just ink and paper until it gets spoken, until it gets believed, until it gets received, right? 
it's alive. So let's prepare our hearts to receive the living word of God. Amen. Would you stand in reverence of God this morning? Can we stand in reverence of the most high God as we go to him in prayer? I want to stand. I want to stand to honor him. Amen. I'm not standing to be uncomfortable. I'm standing to honor my God. Amen. Let's honor him this morning. Heavenly Father, God, we come to you and we thank you so much. We thank you for your many blessings that you've given us, God. And we thank you for the great blessing of your word. And this morning, as each one of us bring needs into your house, and each one of us bring cares into your house, each one of us uh, have a, a measure of joy, joy and a measure of disappointment and a measure of thing in our life that we're dealing with. And God, we need you in all of those areas. So God, this morning, as we stand in reverence of you, in honor of you, God, prepare our hearts. Cleanse our hearts, God to receive the living word that you gave us this morning. God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. You have your Bibles this morning. I'm going to be taking my text from Luke, the 12th chapter. I'm going to preach a little bit exegetically, and I'm going to do some topical preaching as well. I'm going to mix it up because I think there's some very important things here. Jesus speaking. If you have your Bibles, Turn to Luke chapter 12. I did not put the scripture on the screen. We hope that you bring your Bibles with you every week and read with, along with us. Uh, if you have it on electronic form or on your phone, that's okay too. Um, Jesus speaking in parables here, right? One of the one of the things someone said to me once, Pastor, I just like the way you preach. So what do you mean? Just, well, you just kind of put it in common words in, in everyday English and you use... Um, it's like you use real situations and real things I can understand to help me understand God's word. I really like that about you. I'm like, well, that's good. Where'd you learn to do that? I said, Jesus. I just preached like Jesus preached. That's exactly how he preached. He used everyday situations, stories, and parables to communicate with people. So in this place in Scripture, this is what Christ is doing. He's teaching through some parables, through some stories, right? So let's read the word of God. I may stop along the way and do a little expounding, and, and then we'll get to the meat of it. The parable of the rich fool. Now, you're going to notice the very first thing, rich. Yes, flip those lights on if you don't mind folks to read. You're going to notice the parable, rich. Okay, what the heading left out is, this guy's a farmer. He's a farmer, okay? He's not some king or some aristocrat or some big who to do person. This is a farmer who is rich. Verse 13, Luke chapter 12, verse 13. I'm reading from the ESV translation. The word of God says, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide my, uh, the inheritance with me. Verse 14. But he said to him, man who made me a judge or arbitrator over you. And he said to them, Take care and be on guard against covetous, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. I want to stop right there for just a moment. Because that's the conversation that happened that started the story. There are a few things I want to unpack right there for you. Number one, let's notice this. What the people of the day were attempting to require of Christ. Okay? They said... Hey, teacher, will you settle this dispute betwixt us? Now, in those days, it was common for a rabbi to divide law. It was common for a rabbi to sit as kind of a judge over things and quarrels and settle them because they were viewed as wise and smart. Uh, I, it happens today as a pastor. Pastor, we got this conflict. Will you solve it for us? And, and I, it, the very first thing you need to see here is Jesus didn't solve their conflict. He refused to get tangled up in their worldly garbage. Why? Because they were still looking for Christ Jesus to serve them as a ruler and a judge. They were looking for Christ to serve them rather than to save them. You see that? I just want to get that picture. They were coming to Christ Hey, what can you do for me? I need you to settle this dispute between me and this bro my brother. All right? So they were going to Christ to serve them. Why? Because what he wanted was selfish. I want this inheritance. So I want you to serve me to give me what I want. Are you seeing that? 
So Jesus didn't get wrapped up into that. So many times people will come into your life and require something of you and ask something of you, and they really aren't wanting to ask something of you. They're wanting to gain something selfish that they're going to gain out of the deal. Right? Can't tell you how many, Pastor, I want to meet with you. I really think I can help you out. Immediate red flag. Right? right. Then I meet with them. Right? Like, oh, okay, they actually are here to help out. They're great people. Or they're a great person. I, like, I get it. Do not let the enemy draw you into situations of this world to distract you what he calls you to do for the kingdom. That makes sense. I just want to let, show you how Christ didn't allow this worldly problem to mix him up. The next thing I want you to see is his response. He goes, here's how you fix the problem. He didn't say, well, that's your brother or this is your person over there. You have to give him this much and you have to be fair. And do, you, do you deserve? You know, he didn't ask any questions. He didn't prosecute it. Do you deserve this inheritance? Do you not deserve this inheritance? He said, guard your heart against covenants. You see, I, as a pastor, I often get tasked to solve problems. Many times in the way of counseling people. Many, many times of just talking through situations with folk. You know, one truth I've always found at the heart of every situation, most especially a situation that involves two human beings. There's a relationship, right? It's not always husband, wife, or brother, or sister, or cousin, or, or employee, employee. I have a relationship with every human in this room, even if I just met you today for the first time, right? Anytime there's a problem or a situation where there is conflict between two people that is unresolved and growing, there is a sin issue attached to it. Never once have I ever found an unresolved conflict with two human beings that there wasn't a sin issue attached to it somewhere. And I learned a long time ago in counseling and dealing with well, here, here, this and this and this and this and this. Here are the details of this side. Well, this and this and this. Here are the details of this side. What I've learned more often than not is the details are typically irrelevant to the argument. If you'll just attack as the counselor, right, as the person, just find the sin issue and push the button and go, that's the problem right there. So you can get the jealousy out of your heart that's causing all this animosity, that's a problem. So you can get the greed out of your heart that's causing all this, that's a problem. If you can stop lying about the situation that's going on, that's the problem. If you will quit lying to yourself and telling yourself the things that aren't true and trying to convince other people of your lies are true, we can get to the, we can get to the root of this. But until the sin piece stops, we can't find resolution. Guess where I got that technique from? Jesus. Because that's what he's doing right here. He's attacking the sin issue. He's attacking the sin issue. Say amen if you know at least one area of your life where there's a sin issue. Amen. Okay? Attack it. That's how to get it out of there. Attack it. Let's read on. Verse 15. And he said to them, take care of be on guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist of the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentiful, plentifully. And he thought to himself, pay attention, he thought to himself, who's, who's he concerned with? <laughs> he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. Whose crops? Yes. Okay. And he said, I will do this. Who will do it? Him. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And I will store my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, so you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God, I, ooh. ooh. That invokes my Pentecostal home. <laughs> but God no, that but God can I tell you that but God part Woo! 
Can I tell you that? The enemy said that you're a nobody, but God said I'm somebody. The enemy said disease will overtake you, but God said I'm the healer. The enemy said you ain't got enough and won't have enough, but God said I'm your provider. That but God changes things, folks. Amen. That but God will change things. Woo. Amen. I ain't going to preach on that. <laughs> Woo. But God. Woo. Sorry, I that sight squirrel. But God said, fool. When God says fool, I take that serious. Yeah. Fool. This night, your soul is required of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Everything changed. We went from eating, drinking, and being married to God saying, you dying tonight and you ain't taking nothing to leave. I mean, you understand? It, got, it all changed. Say amen if you're dying. Amen. Some of y'all missed it. All of you are. <laughs> I'm dying. We're all, we're, name one person that's lived forever. Everybody that you know that's dead, they're dead. Everybody that you know is alive and ain't dead, but they're going to be. Well, preacher, that don't make me feel too good. Today. It's truth whether you like it or not. Say amen if you're dying. Amen. But here's the good news. For the believer, I'm dying with hope. I'm dying with faith. I'm dying with a promise from the most high God that he's prepared a place eternally for me to be with him. And I got it all worked out. So therefore, until I die, I can live with joy in my heart. Yeah. Woo, that'll preach. That's good. Yeah, you will kind of hands up. I see some of y'all been to help me this morning. Now, let's talk about that. Oh, he's going to preach about money. I want to know what they do with it before I make my decision on what they are. That makes sense? Yeah. Okay, okay. Because that's what God did. I like doing things the way God does. But he forgot some things along the way while he was producing and growing and storing up and uh, harvesting and pruning and all these things with his crop. He forgot a few things about the harvest. First thing is this. The foolish farmer forgot while thinking of the gift, he forgot who the giver was. You notice when I was reading, I'm not going to reread it. My crop, my barns. Listen to me and listen to me well. You, most of you won't hear what I'm about to say because your heart is hardened to what I'm about to say. Your conscious mind and heart will not open up to the truth of my next sentence. You don't own a single thing in this life. Nothing in this world belongs to you at all. It all belongs to him, and he just lets you have it. Because if he wanted anything you had, he could take it just like that. And if he wanted where you're sitting, there would be a greasy spot in your seat. That's hard preaching. You mean, Pastor, all that I worked all these years of my retirement, a 401k, and all my stuff don't belong to you at all. And the most stupid thing that people do is when you say something that profound from the pulpit, they look around and go, well, that may apply to some of these other folks, but not me. Yes, it applies to you. Every person that's ever lived, it applies to. You know why? Because God owns everything. You know what everything means? Everything. It doesn't mean he owns everything except my stuff. No, he owns your stuff. The clothes on your... I'm about to pray hard for you. You know what she said? I said, God owns everything. She goes, well, I wish you'd come get some of that out of my garage. <laughs> <laughs> That's my wife. No, I ain't getting no help from the front. <laughs> Miss Tiffany, I'm glad you walked in. I don't need a little help from the front of the room today. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. He was preoccupied with his own wealth. He literally was ignorantly looking in a mirror, proverbially, going, what shall I do about all this abundance I've got? How can I keep all of this for me? He was preoccupied with his own wealth. He was not grateful. He did not see that his wealth had come from God 
And there was no instance where he actually said, Lord, I'm thankful for my bountiful harvest and that I have an abundance. I don't know how to say this because it's such a mixed room. There's people sitting in the room that could buy the building. There's people sitting in the room that don't know whether they're going to eat or sleep tonight. But when you take our country and where we live, even our lower class is richer than most countries in the world. Amen. We are wealthy whether you know it or believe it or not. Amen. When you examine the things of your life, Can you picture or imagine those things that you have that you're thankful for? Did you stop and thank the one who gave them to you? Do you ever just stop your life and say, Lord, I, want, I just want to say thank you? Nothing else. I just want to say thank you. Come around here on a cold night shelter. You'll be thankful for that king size bed at your house. Young man coming here the other night, it was about 40 degrees outside. The wind was blowing out of the north about 15, 20 miles an hour. It was downright chilly. He was wearing shorts and a t shirt, freezing to death about 10 30 at night. He heard about it, what we do here. You never seen somebody so thankful for a flannel shirt, a pair of jogging pants, or whatever about him. Somebody else's old used sweatpants and somebody's flannel shirt, he got real thankful. You want to see somebody thankful come down here one Thursday night or soon Sunday night, work at the showers. You know what it's like to see a 75 year old woman? come out of a portable shower on the side of the building crying and going, I feel human again. Because she's sleeping on the street that night. Don't take the little things for granted. Everything, I'm going to say that again, everything you have is a gift from God. Amen? Amen. We need to be a humble people. We need to be a thankful people. Because God is truly our provider. Amen? Amen. What else do we forget? foolish farmer forgot while he was thinking of himself he forgot his neighbors there is an old song usually a convention gospel song and the name of the song is if you don't love your neighbor then you don't love God if you don't how does that go If you don't go to help him when he's in trouble, if you gossip about him, you can't do those things and claim you love God. It should be in the heart of the believer that if I have something that my brother requires of me, requires me to give me, then I am, there's a big word, especially for men who struggle with it, obligated. I am obligated to give it to them. I can't tell you, saying about Scooter, please, Father, humble my heart. I cannot tell you when we were serving out of under the bridge out of the parks. How many times I went out there with a cold, on a cold, cold night come home with no jacket on because somebody needed it way worse than I did because I had another one holding the phone. Friends, it is a requirement of the believer. It is a requirement of the believer to have their neighbor and friend in the forethought when it comes to, with, with regards to the needs they may have in their life. That's that toe preaching, y'all. That's me and the word of God right on our toe. 
Amen. Amen. But I'm proud to say that I serve in a church that are some of the most selfless people I've ever seen in my life. I know of four people in this church right now that have or have had the last few days members of our congregation, members of our community, members of our people sleeping in their homes because they don't have anywhere to lay their head and they had a spare bedroom and brought them into their homes. Only my wife picks on me. You don't know how to cook small. I go, baby, there ain't nothing about me small. <laughs> we don't cook small around here because I grew up in big families. My mother's mom was had seven kids. My mom had three, but all of us always had one or two coming along with us. You know what I'm saying? Mama didn't know who was coming for dinner. We cooked in big pots. We go to the store, be me and her. Jace, baby, right? Pack of three pork chops. I always buy the pack of four or five. Why are you cooking the extras? Well, two reasons. If I'm real hungry, I keep eating, and somebody might just come to the house and need something to eat. So you get done, we'll get done with dinner, and there'll be like one more serving or something. You don't want to throw this away? No. No. You don't know if somebody's going to come to the house and hungry that night. I have, I'll have something ready for them. And you know what? I ain't opposed to both of them. Just me. But my mindset when I go to the store is I'm not just going to buy enough for me and my wife. I'm going to buy it in case John and Toronto stop by the house and they're hungry. I'm going to be ready for you. Is that your mindset? Oh, they got socks. I need, I need about three or four pairs of socks. They got eight packs. Buy one, get one free. I need three pairs of socks. Now I have 16. Man, I think that extra pair of socks down in the home with you. You see the mindset? We have got to get to a place where when we view what we have, our neighbor should become a thought in ours. Does that make sense? Next thing you forgot. While he was thinking of his body, he forgot his soul. He only made provisions for his physical needs. Mm. Well, that's me and God have a conversation. Let me put it to you like this. Kevin said to me a minute ago, he said, man, there's a house full of people here today. That's good. And I said, yeah, we're feeding folks today. That's why they're here. What's happening right now is 10 times more important than that food we're going to eat in a little bit. Because that food's going to run out one day and you won't need that. But what's happening right here, right now, the Word of God will last forever and eternity. And it's something you can feast on. It's something that will keep you full. It's something that will heal you. It's something that will heal you. And this is the most important thing going on here today, not to eat. Does that make sense? Yes. The rich farmer was worried about, well, I want to make sure I got plenty to eat. Me and mine, me and mine, me and mine. I prepared for my family. I don't know what you're going to do. I got prepared for me and mine. I don't know what you're going to do. I'm sure glad Jesus Christ is sitting in the throne room of heaven. I'm sure glad Jesus Christ is sitting in the throne room of heaven. When God looked over and said, boy, let me go down there and die. Because I want to save all of them. He didn't look back at the Father and say, Eddie, me and you's doing all right. We ain't got to worry about them. Me and you are sitting here comfortable in heaven. And all power, and all glory, and all love. Everything we have, we need. He put your needs above his. He put your needs above his. I'm sure glad he went on that cross anyway, ain't you? To humble you just a little. If all you do is walk around every day,
worried about their physical needs. Well, I work seven days a week, Pastor. You can't tell me nothing about work. I'll lay my schedule out against any two of you in here almost. Almost. I don't have time for church. I can't, I don't ever read my Bible. I don't have time to pray with my family. I don't have time to pray here. I don't have to. I'm going to put that all in perspective for you. I'll wait while you tell me one thing you're doing more important than spending time with God or serving you. What do we do? We've got our priorities shifted. I like going to the Bible Belt in the world, and I hate it at the same time. My man hates it. My spirit rejoices. We like to vacation in places like Irwin, Tennessee. In uh, Bat Cave, North Carolina. Right up in the hills and hollers. There are little towns threaded all through them hills and hollers and mountains that are wonderful. But if you are vacationing in such town on Sunday, do not expect to go anywhere to eat. Do not expect to go to a store. And do not expect to conduct any kind of business. You know why? Because they're shut down. And you need not ask a question. Because the answer is because we go to church. Those are communities of people that have made going to the house of God, going to pray, going to fellowship, going to serve, going to love. They've made it a priority. And the world is trying to take that away. We need to stop worrying so much about our physical needs and feed our spiritual souls. It's far more important. Point made. Next one. He forgot about his soul. The foolish farmer forgot while thinking of his life. <laughs> Oops. That's on me. I was copying and pasting, and the body from but the B from body got left on life. The body is part of your life. We'll just go with it and call it good. And forgot his morality. <coughs> the soul can be satisfied with nothing short of God. Nothing short of God. And I listened to preachers try to scare you into heaven for years. I always thought that was a crazy approach. Because God don't want something scared. He wants something happy. Something confident. I want to trust God. Not because I can't tell you how many people get saved. But you catch them just about to die. They, they die and got a week or two to live. Well, you accept, oh yeah, I accept my God, I accept the why. I don't want to go to hell. Wrong reason. I want to accept him because he's the best thing going today. Rick Flair is not the best thing going today. It's actually Jesus Christ. Woo! All the pro wrestling fans are laughing. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I want to trust him. I want to give my life to him. I want to repent to him. I want to make him the Lord of my life. I want to accept him as my Savior. Why? Because he is an amazing, loving, awesome, powerful, providing, saving God. Not just to save me from hell. I come to church today to get something to eat. I come to get fed. There's a difference. Amen. Amen. I want to get fed. I want to get fed fellowship. I want to get fed the word. You real would be nice. <laughs> but now let me put those lights out, huh? I want to tell you a very real story. Approximately two weeks ago, exactly two weeks ago, from today, we had church just like we're having today. And there was a crowd, much of who is here today. And on that Sunday, right there where Mama's at, putting them desserts on that table, there was a row of chairs, and there was a man sitting right there. And he was listening to the word of God, and he was sitting on the edge of his seat. He 
was sober-minded, happened to be experiencing homelessness. Someone I'm very familiar with, someone who's been around this town for over 10 years. He was very sober. After church, I had a conversation with that man, and he told me it was a great sermon, and it really touched him that day. I have a tear in his eye. Felt that throat and goes, I really appreciated that, and I needed that today. That night, we were opening for Cold Night Shelter. If you remember, after church, we cleared everything down and started setting up cops and stuff. And I had the night off. I'd been here about four or five days in a row to give out. And I went home, and there was my wife. I... Hi, who are you? Let's go to dinner. It was late, but we were just going anyway. Well, we went two or three places. Finally found somewhere we sit down and eat dinner. We're coming up to US 1, and I've got a little stupid habit of if we drive this way, come by the Civic Center just to see what's happening. When I come by, I saw two cop cars pulling in. I said, well, pull in there. She pulled in. And on the front porch, I found our team and that very man in a confrontation. It appears during the day he went and got him a bottle of alcohol. And when he consumed a lot of alcohol, it made him very argumentative. And that night, he was causing problems in Europe. He had never caused problems before. He picked a fight with two or three people. It was just being disruptive to everything we were trying to do. I came in and even attempted to intervene. I tried to talk to him. He wasn't hearing it. He wasn't having it. Wasn't no way. The officer's gone. I said, "Just he's got to leave tonight." 50 people in here sleeping and I can't have one guy tearing the whole situation up. He's got to go for tonight. I said, come back tomorrow. We'll start over again. We got out and walked across the street heading north on Hopkins and across Knox and Craig. Then he got angry. See that rum had him wanting to fight one more round. He turned, he walked back across the road. The officers who were parked right here saw him and they yelled at him, Sir, don't come back to the property. You have to leave tonight. He picked up two of our churchyard signs and threw them up in the yard. Mad. And he turned, stopped, waited on the cross light to turn red, and began to walk across the street. At that time, a driver going westbound saw the red light and wanted to run it and punched it. Ran through the red light, striking him broadside, throwing him 40 feet from the air. And in that moment, he was brain dead and he passed away. That's two weeks ago right here. Someone that was sitting right there isn't here today. Just like that. Don't get so busy chasing life, chasing wealth, chasing stuff, chasing things, chasing alcohol, chasing dope, chasing greed, don't get so busy chasing all that, you miss eternity. Because your morality is very real. Tonight, your life may be required of you. Tonight. Are you ready? Are you ready?